Prime Minister Tony Abbott has been framed twice this week in media reports. It shocked me. And it says something about the media and Abbott's opponents in the Liberal Party. First example, this rubbish, this report, quoting unnamed Liberals suggesting Tony Abbott may have just cost the lives of Australians Andrew Chan and Muran Sukumaran facing execution in Indonesia for smuggling eight kilos of heroin. Abbott is accused of costing the two men perhaps their last chance of a reprieve by appearing to threaten Indonesia. When Indonesia was struck by the uh, Indian Ocean tsunami, uh, Australia sent a billion dollars worth of assistance. We in Australia are always there to help you uh, and we hope that uh, you might reciprocate. Now that wording was clumsy and Indonesia's foreign affairs spokesman hit back. From what I know, uh, no one responds well to threats. But Abbott's comments actually made no difference at all. Here's why. Indonesia's president, in fact, has made it crystal clear again and again since last year he will never stop the execution of drug smugglers. We are not going to compromise for drug dealers. No compromise. No compromise. I tell you, there will be no amnesty for drug dealers. So no relief for the Australian? No? And last month, Indonesia did shoot five foreign drug smugglers, including a Dutchman. Joining me is Victorian Liberal Party President Michael Kroger and former Labor campaign strategist Bruce Hawker. Abbott is being framed, true or false? True, on that issue. There's absolutely nothing Tony Abbott said in that press conference, nothing at all, which indicated he was in any way at all, Andrew, threatening the Indonesians. I read that whole press release, uh, the report of what he said, and you played it there. That is an absolute absurdity to think that Tony Abbott in any way threatened the Indonesians and the Indonesian Foreign Affairs spokesman got it completely wrong. Whoever put to him that Tony Abbott had threatened the Indonesians, he hadn't. We're in this feverish pitch at the minute where everything Tony Abbott seems to do is taken out of context, exaggerated and used against him. Sooner or later it'll die down because people are getting very sick of it. Uh, Bruce, uh, this uh, report paints a picture of heroic Julie Bishop trying to save these men's lives, a glimmer of hope, and then comes Tony Abbott spoiling all Julie Bishop's hard work. What do you read into a leak like that? It's the drip, you know, it's the drip, 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 drip. As soon as it looks like he might be getting back onto something looking like terra firma, someone will come in and destabilise him. And I think that's We've probably the inevitable. We've seen it with uh, Kevin Rudd, your former boss. It happens in politics all the time. And uh, unfortunately for Tony Abbott, I think this is the inevitable uh, course for him until he is finally removed as Prime Minister. Now, Michael, there's one thing about legitimately, you know, having criticism of Tony Abbott's deci decisions, mm. that's one thing, and also another saying that he can't recover, and I suspect that you might be, might be in that camp, that he can't recover, and let's face it. But this is different. This is active sabotage, again, apologies, uh, Bruce, that we saw, of the kind that we saw from uh, Kevin Rudd against Labor. This is vicious. Mm. No, no, the Prime Minister and the government certainly can recover, and uh, as long as they keep to the core central themes of what the government needs to do, which is to restore the Australian economy, which is going to promote jobs and development in this country, uh, they'll be on the right track. As long as they keep on the barnacle side of things, uh, that's when the government gets into trouble. But to your point, um, is there active sabotage? There is clearly a number of leaks coming on a continuous basis out of the ERC and areas surrounding that. Um, well, today another someone, one, of course. Yeah. Uh, today another one uh, in the News uh, Corp uh, papers saying that the government was mm. was was saved millionaires mm. from mm. from having their pensions taken off them mm. and then hit everyone else including mm. the poor and look um the thing about all these reports is unsourced unnamed etc some's probably true some is untrue and the answer is who knows any who knows at all which part of this is true or not what we are seeing of course is a very concerted campaign against peter credlin and you have to wonder you have to wonder if she was the chief of staff to a labor prime minister oh. every feminist and women's group in this country would be out there saying sexism, attacking, blah, blah, blah. Have we heard one voice from the left women in the country, in this country, saying, isn't it fantastic to have a powerful woman as Chief of Staff of the Prime Minister? Not a single word from any of them. That's because the left tend to fight not for a principle but for a side. Bruce, uh, you've seen this kind of thing very close up. 
Um, does this mean, however unfair, however sick, however despicable the kind of Liberals are that are promoting their candidate through this kind of tactics, is it inevitable that it will go on, go on until Tony Abbott is removed? I think so. Uh, I don't share Andrew's optimism on behalf of Tony Abbott uh, that there's going to be any change in the public's perceptions of him or, in fact, that he's going to be particularly capable of changing his way of operating. Uh, and I think that's what the Australian electorate's looking for, something that suggests that he is making a significant change in his approach. I, I can uh, see a lot of evidence of change, can't you? No, oh, I haven't oh, seen I've it seen yet. I've policy, style, uh, repentance, all that kind of stuff. It's just not being given any chance to yeah. make sure it can work. Well, he's actually got to come out and make the big changes too. He talks things mm. up, he talks things up, and then we don't actually hear about it. I mean, I, I'm just not sure myself exactly where we are with the these changes to the paid parental leave scheme right now. And they're talking about some policy changes, but I actually haven't seen what they are, who's going to pay for them and so forth. Well, they can't quite so, turn on a dime. I mean, this, well, this is this happening. this has been coming since before Christmas, Andrew. Yeah, yeah. Well before Christmas. So, I agree with so you. I don't, it's too late. I think I agree that's with his you. problem. I don't think he he can actually get to the point where he can concede that he actually has changed. Well, and, and on the Credlin point, you know, I have some sympathy for her. I think chiefs of staff are always <laughs> blamed for uh, the sins of their, of their masters. And I suspect that she's done a lot of things in her time just to try to keep him under control, mm. uh, maybe with limited success. But uh, as I've said before, I think a, a chief of staff's got to be... 70% no. diplomat, 30% thug, and I think she's got it the other way around, and that's giving people ammunition to attack her. I agree with you, but I think what's happening here is a one-two strategy. First, they force Abbott to dump her. That's the, the strategy. And if he does, they'll say, oh, look, a terrible scapegoat, making a woman a scapegoat for his own sins, he's got to go. It's Possibly. a classic setup. Possibly. But, but, listen, but there might be some people who just want to see her go in the hope that they can save him. I don't know that that's necessarily the thinking of everybody inside you know, the party no. who want to see him go. I don't think there's a... My guess is there's not one unified position on all this. I think you're seeing leaks coming from all over the place by people who probably aren't talking to other leakers. Well, that may be true, but let's talk about another of those leaks to the second stitch-up, which is uh, this report by John Lyons in The Australian, again quoting unnamed Liberal heroes, claiming Abbott in a meeting in late November uh, uh, with his top military advisers and asked whether he should unilaterally send in 3,500 Australian troops into Iraq to fight the Islamic State without even US support. Now, Tony Abbott yesterday denied it and said the head of our Defence Forces had no memory of such a thing either. Have a listen. The story is false. It is false. It is fanciful. I've spoken to the Chief of the Defence Force about it and he is as mystified by this as I am. Now, I'm calling bull on this story for a number of reasons, but what's your take? Well, Andrew, I think you put it on your blog yesterday afternoon. The Americans had already announced they were going to deploy... 1,500 more Well, they were, They'd already announced they were going to deploy troops. How can John Lyons write a story like that saying, oh, Abbott was talking to people about unilateralism? Couldn't... The Americans already announced they were going in. So the story was a complete nonsense. These stories that are not checked with anybody, they weren't checked with the Prime Minister's office, clearly not checked with defence officials. You run this full story and then the country wastes a whole day with the Prime Minister having to deny this and people then taking a while to realise the story is an utter nonsense. But again, designed to, to damage Tony Abbott, the story was nonsense. High rotation. The thing is, uh, Bruce, you know, the idea that a unilateral invasion, what, you first need Iraq's permission, let me just say, and mm. Tony Abbott would absolutely be aware of that. But the other thing is this. Let's say he did ask, and the, he, the Australian Defence Force says he had no recollection of it, he did ask, what about sending in 3,500 troops with Iraq's permission? Um, Aren't you just throwing up ideas to your top advisers, getting the, uh, the, the best advice you can and proceeding, as he did, which wasn't an invasion of Iraq? Isn't this what a leader does? Throw up ideas, get the advice, make a cool decision on, on base. I suspect that's what he was doing because he's heavily qualified his responses. He keeps saying they weren't formal requests for advice and so forth. Uh, but getting back to the issue about the damaging leaks, this is a particularly damaging one for him because... Even though it's false. Because it goes to what people think is his weakness, that he's, he's given to impetuosity or he might just do something that's, uh, that, but he didn't. That, that gets us into <laughs> all sorts of trouble. I know, but it's a whole point, a story no, leak I'm, like that I'm, I'm, about I'm how he's impetuous I'm accepting and he that, didn't Andrew. actually do it. I'm going to the analysis of what's behind it. it and, true. And, and I think that... The point about that is that, you know, on the TV news this last night, you would have seen all that, you would have seen some denials from him, but people watching it, I suspect, would have said, 
that's Tony Abbott for you. That's the sort of person he is. And that's his problem. I think the, the Australian public's attitudes towards him are now set in concrete. And it's not going to change. It's clickbait. The thing is, it's now clickbait. So you've put any false story up there and they guarantee that it'll be taken, it'll be put on high rotation because people, oh, Tony Abbott again. And it's false. I just think, where the hell are we up mm. to in this country? Mm. It's like the other thing false uh, here. Peter <coughs> Credlin chaired in this story. Peter Credlin chaired meetings with the Expenditure Review Committee, which looks at spending cuts. Three members of that review committee says, we were there all the time. We didn't mm. see that. Mm. What is very interesting is what's happening with some of the News Limited papers, the Australian in particular, who are running these stories. Now, this is fascinating. For the political insiders, I yeah. mean, the Australian has a go at Labor, they have a go at the Liberal Party, you know, the, the Australian More newspaper... Well, well, the Australian <laughs> newspaper bagged the, bagged the Howard government for years over the, the you know, the... You know, the Many, many issues. Um, the Royal Commission into, into the payments to the Iraqi government over the, the wheat scandal, etc, etc, etc. But what we're seeing is the Australian newspaper now running this stuff on the front page. These stories were wrong, but yet the Australian ran on the front page. What does that tell you about the psyche of a great paper like the Australian in the current environment? They seem to be feeding a lot of this stuff and some of these stories are complete and other nonsense. Yeah, well, that's, I think, what uh, the fear is in uh, the Abbott camp, that the Australian, the Murdoch paper, snip. Cut them loose. Well, uh, look, that, we're, that we're out of time, but we'll, we'll be back with more after the break. <laughs> David Hicks had good news this week. He'd trained with al-Qaeda in Afghanistan, met Osama bin Laden, and in 2007 pleaded guilty to a US military court to giving aid to terrorists. But now his conviction has been quashed. The court didn't have the jurisdiction to try Hicks for that offence. Tony Abbott says there will be no apology, but Bill Shorten says Hicks is a victim. There's no doubt that on one hand, David Hicks was probably uh, was foolish to get caught up in that Afghanistan conflict. But clearly, uh, there's been an injustice done to him. And back again with Michael Kroger and Bruce Hawker. Bruce, David Hicks was just foolish? Just foolish, I it? think I'd drag the thesaurus out and use a few more words to describe uh, David Hicks. And, uh, and I think, in fairness to Bill Shorten, he did come back later on and uh, and toughen up his words. Yeah, so. but that's, on a, that's when an advisor tells you. But the, feel, the thing is, his gut instincts told him to use the word foolish. What is it with the left and not taking terrorism seriously? I don't think that's fair. Uh, you know, look at Tony Blair. I mean, he was, he's been vilified for his engagement in, uh, in, in uh, Iraq. Uh, you know, there have been left prime ministers who have gone in and, and done hard things. Bruce, if so I, if so I, if I, I, I ran a camera on you... Say that. No, no, but if I ran a camera on you and said, David Hicks, you know, uh, what, what, was, what was driving him to serve with three terrorist groups? Uh, you would not use first the word foolish. I mean, instinctively, no, you know, you would not. There's a saying in politics, you don't hug a mug, and, uh, and Hicks is the sort of person that you should steer well away from. Then explain but, it. But, uh, you know, that's a matter for Bill Shorten to, to describe, you know, way, where he thinks he was foolish. I mean, he certainly was foolish, but he also was serving with, uh, with al-Qaeda forces in uh, Pakistan. But so uh, I'm not... I'm not here to defend that guy, but you know, at all. And I'm I just think, wondering but about but Bill it's Shorten. part of the learning curve for a, for a politician. You really. said yeah. learning curve, right? Yeah. Learning curve on something so basic, Michael. That's my whole point. Is Bill Shorten ready, or no, is he just coming under the radar? Oh uh, no, and yes, um, foolish. Yeah, and then Hicks said himself, he was just on holidays in Afghanistan. So he's got a foolish young man on holidays in Afghanistan. That's one interpretation. The alternative interpretation is he was training with a terrorist organisation who was engaged in a firefight with the Indian Army, uh, trained with another terrorist organisation before Al-Qaeda. It's all in Gerald Henderson's article yesterday in The Australian. Um, Shorten is uh, at great danger of being exposed as an absolute lightweight. Uh, this was an absurd comment by Shorten. As you said, his gut instinct was completely wrong. He's come with no policy. This is the year of policy development. We've seen nothing. It's mid-feb already and there's nothing from the Labor Party. Shorten could collapse in a heat very quickly because his brand equity, by the way, in Australian politics is as the only man who ever stabbed two Prime Ministers in the back. He's got no policies on the board and with comments like David Hicks is foolish, make him look very, very silly. Well, Bruce, I had a red-hot go at him at, the, um, at my editorial, so just in fairness, I'm going to uh, give the floor to you. Uh, the key problem facing Australia, of course, is that we're getting $100 million a day deeper in debt every time on top of what 
the record deficits Labor left us. So that's obviously a big problem. What is Bill Shorten's plan to fix that? Well, as you Bill, understand, it's up to Bill Shorten to come out and tell us that plan. So I think you don't, coming... know. you don't know. No, I don't know what his plan is I going to be. And and I, and I think it's fair to say that he's he not know. going. He, he doesn't know. know. No, no, no. no one knows. He's, he's got knows. no idea. Bill Shorten's going to have to come out and tell Australia in the coming 12 months what his plan is to reduce debt and to sort out some of the problems that the country's in. I don't think shocking. I just, no. I just put to you uh, Andrew, the cru not great really. financial not really. problem facing Australia. You're really connected with Labor. And even you don't know what Bill but, Shorten's plan but is. But, Andrew... You've got no idea. Why? I've got no idea. No one's got any idea. But let's, let's be real politic for a moment. You know, I got, am. When you've got a Prime Minister like Tony Abbott there, who's doing everything he can to shoot himself in the head, who is basically really doing very little to try to get things under control because he's still going out there saying that big business is going to have to pay for some sort of paid parental leave plans further down the line, uh, whatever it is finally saying, going to no, be. No, no. You're, you're but, saying real politics. Well, you're saying real politics. Yeah, I'm absolutely. saying national interest. And I'm also saying journalists, right? National no interest say to Tony whoever doing. comes in... No, no different to uh, Tony Whoever Abbott. comes in has in to fix this huge problem. Mm. Uh, journalists should be saying, it. what is your plan... And you don't know what it is. I don't know what it is. The election's a year and a half away. Mm. Mate, this mm. is not and good. And this is, this is no. the year when he needs to come out and talk about that. And I'll just make it's this not. point. No, I make this point that, that you know, lab, the, the Achilles heel for Labor is always a question of economic management. Bill has to come out and do something big this year and make it clear to the Australian electorate that he's got a plan to bring things under control. Plan. Well, Listen, he's got Bruce, to do it. And that's Bruce, exactly what Kevin Bruce, Rudd did in Bruce, 2007. Bruce, you, you know between us three. <laughs> Billy, and no one else? No one else. <laughs> Billy, Billy's got no idea. He hasn't, no, got, he hasn't got a clue. He's like Robert Redford in the candidate before the election, sitting there saying to his advisors, poor old Bowen, who doesn't have any of the tax rates. Well, well, have we got any idea, fellas, what we're going to do? And well, they've got no idea. And could, by the way... What he could do, by the way... Just no do, what he could do is what Tony Abbott did and just come out and lie about everything. No, well... He make all these promises no, 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 that get him no, in all sorts that, of trouble. Yeah, that's... Abbott, Abbott never broke that, promises. That, that is incredibly unfair. No cuts unfair. to health, no cuts to education, no cuts to pension, no cuts to the ABC, and on it goes. Yeah, and an $18 billion deficit. And then say... And then say, oh, sorry, uh, well, well, I've got to sort this problem out. You know, and there are bigger problems. Yeah. Well, think about that before the election yeah, when the, you start lying the to biggest, the Australian The bigger electorate. problem is that with $18 billion <laughs> deficit turned into $48 billion deficit. That's the big he, problem. The and big by the way, he's no, got, before you he's go... lying to the Australian yeah, public. Sure, yeah, yeah. Of course it Just is. Just go back onto this whole question. Why is you he talk on about, such a low You support. talked about the left's soft attitude to terrorism. And, and the important point is this. The left see every international conflict through the eyes of anti-Americanism and anti-Semitism. And if you understand that... You're talking about the you Australian Labor Party doing you that? That is an outrageous slur. You can't say that about the Australian Labor Party. I'm sorry, I've changed that's... the subject. It's got nothing to do with the ALP. We're well, talking about the well, left. You're talk... Well, the, you're the, talking the... about the left of the hey, Australian yeah, political Yeah, the left of the Labor Party. The left, the Labor... Yeah, the left oh, of the Labor Party. Party. The left of the Labor Party. Like and that defines now. their attitude to every international conflict. How does it... How does it you know, affect America, and how do we oppose the state of Israel? And everything they say or do is through that prism. Oh, but you know, Australian Labor governments have been heavily involved in all those. What about major the left? What about the New years? South Wales right? What about them? what about the right of the New South Wales Labor Party, who've who've traditionally That's been what, who've traditionally been I'll supporters of the state of Israel, and they've given an, up? I'll give you both an example: <laughs> the fact that parts of the Labor Party, now led by Bob Carr, yeah. are abandoning Israel mm. and siding with its enemies, including the Hamas terrorist group. Yeah, well, I think it's it's a big okay. call. It's a big call to okay. say that there is anti that that equates with anti-Semitism. A bloke you cannot you make that claim. For. A bloke Bob you Carr for. You know, has been all always been a big supporter of the state of Israel. Not anymore. But he's not, not going to go out there and, make, and, and be completely, uh, you know... Mate, he's I just not going to come out and just say anything to suit any particular Bruce, group out Bruce, there. I have you know, had, there are real issues in I've Palestine. I've had we know senior that. Labor figures, ex-ministers, ring me furious, so upset with this betrayal of Israel mm. by people like Bob Carr. Uh, I wish they would go public about mm, this because mm. it is a real issue. Mm. Well, I think maybe, it's well, well, let them come out and make the claim. But Bob Carr's never going to have any problem arguing the points about what's fair. You know, and the State of Israel has to be in a position to defend itself if it is going to go out there and continue uh, you know, its occupation of well, Palestine except he turned, and, 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 he turned and, on, and all those things. He turned, that, he turned that, on that Julia Gillard. He turned on Julia Gillard over the question of Israel. Of Israel. And exactly right. No. Exactly right. Michael Crozier, Bruce Hawker, thank you so much for.